Hi. Um, yeah, um, I'm kind of in the latter stages of the e futures thing. It's great because we've got a whole, all three generations of us on the first cohort, and um, supposedly, yeah, coming towards the end of my PhD, well, another year to go. Um, so I'll have some results to show you um, on my PhD, looking at um, more generally, it's about the energy costs of transport to work. But I thought I'd pick up on this one particular theme, which is vulnerability to oil shocks. Um, so you'll kind of get a, a quick sweep through my PhD culminating in, in uh, some work that I've done on vulnerability which I think is very important um, in, light, in light of the fact that oil is a finite resource. So, um, there's an overview, a uh, nice photo of Sheffield there with the two diverging paths going off into the sunset both containing cars. Uh, come back to that later. So I'm just going to talk about why I've why I'm doing this PhD, some of the motivations behind it, uh, the methods that I'm using to analyse such a complex, uh, unpredictable system of humans getting to work and back every day, a um, few results, and then talk about some further work. So this is really the motivation behind my PhD. Some of you might remember, I think I put this same slide up with the uh, energy hierarchy on my very first um, talk for eFutures. This is the energy hierarchy the diagram on the right, which uh, basically is a framework for thinking about energy, energy use. It's obviously a massively big problem, and we have many options of how to deal with it. You have the demand side, which is more towards the top, and then the supply side. And basically this um, diagram from the Institute of Mechanical Engineers is making the point that the demand side is not, uh, is kind of overlooked too much. It should actually be first priority, priority number one, because we're facing a massive energy problem. But all of the sub-problems, like moving towards renewables, reducing CO2 emissions, get far easier if we're actually using less energy. So that's, that's kind of what's driving it. So I'm really aiming at the top of the energy hierarchy, and I think there's not enough attention there. Um, and so where to look from there? Well, I'm looking at commuting because it's a very large energy user, and people don't really look at commuting from an energy perspective very much. Usually energy is very much about electricity um, and the kind of big technologies behind it. But actually it's something that you do every single day is drive to work and back. And it's kind of an energy use that people don't often take into account. So the research questions are, okay, where are these the most kind of energy intensive and energy efficient forms of travel to work? Um, and who are they? What kinds of people? Why is that? And from there, from that foundation, you can build up to inform decision makers. So that's the approach. Uh, quick background, obviously over the last 100 years we've seen massive shifts in the way that people travel to work. So this is just the kind of um, survey data reflecting that. You've got declining walking, massive rise in the cars. I mean, it really is quite a radical shift in a relatively short space of time in the historical context. Why is this important from an energy perspective? Well, as we, as we all know, cars in the UK are not particularly efficient, and they're not a particularly efficient way of getting people from A to B in any case. So if you uh, take some assumptions about the average efficiency and average trip distance, you can convert that into a back of the envelope uh, estimate of energy use, and you can see that the energy impact of this shift is absolutely vast. You're using a, almost 10 times more energy um, for the average trip to work and back on the y-axis in megajoules than we were 100 years ago. Um, and you can see the, the dominance of the car. I'd like to uh, emphasise this is rough estimate, uh, rough estimate um, based on um, the best available data. And look at the stretch at x-axis. That's to make you think about the future in the context of the next slide, which is peak oil. And I like the fact that this is 1962 that um, this analysis was done. So we've known about it for a long time. It's fairly common sense. Oil is a finite resource. And if you look at any other resource, you have a, a kind of phase of extraction and then uh, a plateau and then a decline. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it certainly is going to happen. So we need to plan for it. And uh, transport is very important here because it's over 90% dependent on our most rapidly depleting uh, source of energy, which is oil. So that's the motivation. How do we deal with it? Well, obviously, I want to use the best available data, and we do have 
very, very high quality data on this. Originally I was going to have a table here, but um, I was told that was boring, so I've got a map of the data instead, just to represent um, the kind of multiple levels at which uh, data, uh, census data is presented. It covers the entire nation, so, um, and you've got a response rate of around 100%. So this is very high quality data, but they only um, give it to you at the aggregate level. And what a load of different levels you have going on there. So you've got kind of the, the broad scale, and then you zoom in a little bit to the regional level, and then um, the Sheffield level, loads of stuff called LSOAs, MSOAs, is kind of what we use as administrative units, lower and super and medium super output rates. But anyway, so th th that's what the data looks like. On top of that, we also, this is just kind of counts over areas, so not particularly detailed. On top of this, you have surveys. So I'm using something called the British Household Panel Survey, which um, gives you much more detail at the individual level. So that's the data we've got. Um, you can also generate more variables uh, based on your knowledge of the geography. So this is just a very simple example of how I've calculated um, kind of level of isolation of different places to known employment centres. Um, you can get much more advanced by looking at the transport infrastructure. You can look at the location of uh, rail networks, bus stops and stuff like this. But you can get these geographical variables in there. So that's the data. We've got high quality data on commuting. But how to merge them all together, they're kind of incompatible. They operate at different scales from the individual to the geographical. Um, and another slide I cut out was on spatial microsimulation, which is the method that I'm using to kind of uh, bring the different data sets together. And basically, to cut a long story short, the way it works is it plucks out individual level data based on the aggregate constraints and plunks them into your individual regions. And it's based on an algorithm called iterative proportional fitting. Look that up if you're really interested. Plus, I'm interested in energy. So here's a number one result that I think is pretty interesting and uh, shows the utility of drilling down to the individual level. So the census data um, shows us how many trips people take by different modes. It gives you counts. Um, and that's in the left hand graph there. So you've got um, cars, these are car drivers kind of dominating here. Um, the error bars aren't actually error bars. That's the variability of um, MSRA zones in Yorkshire and the Humber. So it goes up from about 70% to surprisingly low to kind of under, just under 30%. Um, so you get a kind of mixed picture. What the census doesn't tell you is the actual breakdown of distance travelled by each of these modes. <coughs> so if you move to that, uh, to the next graph, you're looking at the proportion of distance made by each mode. And from our model, you can see that the, that the dominance of the car increases slightly. Uh, trains, um, which one's trains? Oh yeah, the yellow one actually increases a little bit because your average trip by train is quite low. Um, and the other ones, some of them shrink because you travel very little. And then finally, if energy really is the master resource, as we believe in energy, in energy futures, we should be looking at the final graph, which is energy use, which tells almost a totally different story from the first graph, which is what kind of administrators and stuff are using. So that's a really interesting result that comes out of my work that, that gets overlooked. It's the absolute dominance of the car in energy terms. And it's actually, if you add it all up, the car uses more than 10 times the amount of energy for all other modes of transport of modes of transport to work put together. So that's an interesting result. Another one, which is what the talk's about, because I'm um, pulling together all these different variables, um, you can also include economic variables from the uh, survey data. And you can estimate uh, what proportion of people's income are they spending on travel to work. So this is just a, again, I've created a, a, a series of indices, but this is the uh, kind of, this is one of the interesting ones, that's the economic vulnerability index. And the way that works is it's estimating how many people um, in each area spend more than 10% of their equivalised household income on travel to work and back. Um, so it, the, the numbers are surprisingly high and potentially higher than the numbers of people who are living in fuel poverty, which are people living, uh, spending more than 10% of their income 
on domestic energy. So again, it shows that the energy costs of transport are kind of overlooked. Um, as you'd expect, the kind of people living in the far out areas tend to be, have higher levels of vulnerability. But also note that there are some areas, such as the centre of Sheffield, where you have high proportions of people spending a lot of money, a lot of their income, just on getting to work. And I suspect that's due to um, rail travel, people in city travel from um, uses trains, which is obviously more expensive. So there are a couple of preliminary results. Beyond the PhD, well, I'll get a bit ahead of myself because I've actually got a finished PhD still another year to go. Um, and I'd like to do a lot of stuff like validation of the results, the various methods to do that, um, including the interaction between different variables. You can compare that with how they interact with census data um, and um, stuff like that. I'm working on uh, three papers at the minute, one more on the kind of computational method side one on the uh, general approach for looking at commute patterns and the one about vulnerability which I quite find, uh, find quite interesting I'm aiming for a publication in a journal called Area. Uh, further studies, well I'd like to do a bit of network analysis obviously at the moment I'm only dealing with aggregate um, data um, but splitting that down to individuals but I'm not looking at the actual routes that they're taking on the ground to get to work from A to B so you have to follow the road network and there's a lot of um, information that's just come out and a lot of modelling tools that you can do that. So I'd like to include some network analysis to look at how the average distance, bear, um, Euclidean distance, is not the same as root distance and how that varies from place to place and the impact of that on energy use. Modelling chains, this is where it starts getting exciting. If you intervene in the system, say build a bike path or uh, try and encourage teleworking, what kind of impact might that have on um, on your energy use um, and that involves agent based models and also refine the vulnerability um, indices. Post PhD, well government's interested in this kind of stuff, they deal with very large data sets and hopefully are planning for a future where we're all constrained. The private sector, well obviously they like to know where people are flowing through to locate their stores but there's also other reasons why it could be useful for decision makers in the private sector. Or by schools, which a lot of you know is my kind of thing, this research could be really useful in identifying and targeting uh, quite on quite a local level, so very efficient targeting of resources to try and increase the rate of cycling in certain places. Or again, just carry on in the kind of academic field to feed into broader models of energy and climate. And just out of interest, the DEC, uh, the DEC model for 2050 it has the demand side on it and if you put the demand side to the absolute maximum on their transport model demand stays constant but the evidence already is suggesting that demand uh, that the number of vehicle kilometers people are traveling is already decreasing so there's something wrong there and there's actually an EPSRC funding thing um, in Aberdeen University where they're starting to, to look into that so they're possible futures one final pretty graph it's another map because I'm a geographer is uh, just to illustrate the data from which you can start doing this network analysis. So we know in Stocksbridge you've got flow data from people going from Stocksbridge to all other wards in the UK. And as you'd well, you'd expect from the previous uh, from the previous maps I showed that they would be going to Barnsley because it's closer, but they're not. Um, and when you start doing a network analysis, you can see what roads they're going. So that's just the kind of interesting taster of the stuff I'm going to be doing. So thanks a lot for listening. I'll be really interested to hear any questions. And uh, cheers for listening to my talk. So any questions?